Okay. Uh, recording? Are we recording yet?
Hi, and welcome to Appalachian Traditions, a virtual discussion of traditional Appalachian craft, music, and dance. I'm Darcy Holdorf, the program director here at the John C. Campbell Folk School. And today we have Catherine Ellis joining us. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining. We had almost 800 people register for this webinar. And I see we've got almost 400 already in the room. So thank you for coming. We're delighted to have so much interest in these webinars. And we're especially glad to see so much interest in natural dyeing because thanks to a generous donation, we have a newly established dye garden here um, at the folk school. And it's an incredible resource for us for our dye program. And we're looking forward to using materials sourced on campus for our upcoming dye classes. And I think Catherine will talk a little bit about that. So I'd like to give you just a brief update on what's going on here at the folk school. We have canceled classes through the end of 2020, but we are not closed. So essential staff is working both at home and on campus. We will continue to produce webinars such as this one and potentially more in the fall. We are working to develop a series of classes that will be held in late summer and fall in subjects that are tied to the garden. These are short classes in gardening and nature studies, as well as classes that use materials from the garden, um, such as natural dyeing from our dye garden. So these classes will be limited in size. We'll be running only a few at a time with a lot of safety precautions. They'll be held primarily outdoors or in our open air venues, such as open house and our festival barn. So please sign up for our e-news and keep an eye on our Facebook and our social media. We'll be announcing a schedule of those classes soon. Um, we are planning on resuming our regular programming in January of 2021, assuming that um, things are better in terms of the pandemic. Um, we are working really hard on a new catalog, which features classes from January through June of 2021. And we'll be releasing that e-catalog this Friday so that you can see all of our classes for the first six months of 2021. You can browse our catalog format and you can call to register. So we are not printing, um, doing a print catalog, but we are working to publish a print catalog in December, which will include all of the classes for the entire year. Um, so this webinar series is funded by a grant that has brought a lot of new traditional craft programs to the folk school, including the master class that Catherine Ellis was scheduled to teach this year. So in lieu of an in-person workshop, we are honored to be able to bring you this virtual presentation on natural dyes. So if this is your first time joining us, just a really quick note about how this webinar program works. If you move your mouse, you will see a toolbar at the bottom of the screen with three icons. The chat is a place for everyone to interact and I see a lot of you are already saying hello and telling us where you're from, from Scotland, from Charlotte, from Chicago, Milwaukee. So that's really exciting. Please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining from. Um, the raise your hand function, we have so many people in this program that I do not think we're going to be able to use that. I see some of you have raised your hand already. If we have time, we will get to that. Um, but I do encourage you to use the chat and the Q&A just to make sure that we get your questions answered. Um, the Q&A is a place where you can post questions for Catherine or ask questions about this program or the folk school in general. So such as, will you be providing a recording of this program? Um, yes, we will send a link in a follow-up email with lots of resources, with links to things that we share in the chat and with a recording to this program. So I've invited Martha Owen to give us a brief introduction to the folk school and to help us introduce Catherine. Um, for many of our regular students and instructors, Martha is synonymous with the folk school. She is our resident artist in spinning, in knitting and crochet, felt making, dyeing, and surface design. She's a musician, a storyteller, a performer, a dancer, and an all-around multi-talented woman. So she has been and continues to be an incredible advocate for the folk school where she has been teaching since 1984. She lives just down the road where she tends her flock of sheep. She processes her own wool and performs with her family. You can actually see them perform in one of our virtual morning songs. We do a Friday morning morning song and we'll share a link to that in the chat. So hi, Martha, are you there? I'm here. Do you see me? <laughs> I brought everybody a bouquet 
a bouquet, look. This is how I do a bouquet. A bouquet that comes from marigolds and madder and cochineal and indigo. I've been doing a lot of dyeing lately, trying to get a whole rainbow that will be part of a class that I hope will happen in May 2021. For It's called Fair Isle for Hand Spinners. So I had, I had the time, so I did a lot of dyeing. Um, I'm the resident artist here for spinning, knitting, felt making, dyeing, surface design, and crochet. And natural dyeing crosses into all those areas. It's been very exciting to me to notice how much interest there is in natural dyeing at this time. When I first came here, uh, whenever that was, 1978, uh, I have actually brought my best from my first week here at the folk school. We did a class outside. It was the beginning of the craft program here at the school. And we, the way the class worked, as soon as we had enough yarn to do a dye pot, uh, we did one. And every dye pot weighed one pound. And we went around the area and we collected walnuts and cherry bark and rhododendron leaves and onion skins. And we did a few things that were exotic like madder root and indigo. And we didn't know much and our teacher knew a little bit more than we did. So, um, but it just opened this door to natural dyeing. And I had been looking for colors uh, by looking at colors, like uh, going to uh, a thread display and looking at all the colors uh, and trying to find the colors that I was seeing in nature. And the very first time we pulled a skein of yarn out of a dye pot, I knew that was it. That was where the colors were coming from. If you see in my bouquet how all the colors go together and we can use these bouquets to card like watercolor blend. So you can see in this sweater over here, which is almost the last one I did where I blended colors, you can dye at any time. That's what I love to say uh, because you could dye fabric, you can dye wool, you can dye yarn, you can blend them together. You can spin it as a single solid color and dye over the natural sheep colors. You can do whatever you want. The thing is that there are, there's lots of ways to go after this. And we can study through uh, the work of Mary Frances Davidson who came here to the folk school and learned about natural dyeing who she kind of wrote a book that was sort of like your granny's recipe book. You weren't sure exactly what she meant all the time. Uh, and she taught a fellow named Jim Lyles and Jim was one of my dye mentors and his angle was much more historical. He was trying to make dye recipes available to the modern person, especially me who was not very scientific. I'm more like a cook. Um, but he went back to old recipes and tried to bring them forward so that we could use them. He also taught us about Indian chintz and, um, oh, the red coats. What did they dye the red coats uh, uniforms with? All those kind of things. After him, I bumped into uh, Carolee Brack Kaiser, who did a lot of production dyeing, a lot of rendezvous dyeing. She got multiple colors and she's just written a book a few years ago. And this brings us up to the um, Art and Science of Natural Dyes by Catherine Ellis. We're very excited to have this book because you know what? I believe Catherine knows what she's talking about. Different than me, I just kind of pretend and hope for a colorful life. Uh, but Catherine has taken this dye thing and, and explored it and explored it and explored it and explored it and ha has grown her own plants and tried ways to manipulate them. And what you find out when you get into natural dyeing is you can study the world, you can study every culture of the world, you can study history, you can study uh, the chemistry of your water, you can study nature, you can compare between this year and last year and see what those plants gave you for color, depending on the weather, you get different colors out of plants. And Catherine has spent a lot of time gardening and studying and it's uh, very, very exciting to a person like me to have somebody of Catherine's stature um, 
just follow an idea and follow it and follow it and follow it. And um, I'm trying to think of what else I should say. Um, well, Catherine's going to talk about the art and science of natural dyes that she wrote with Joy Boutrop. Uh, it was out in 2019. And I just want to mention uh, here at the folk school, we're very, very excited to have a natural dye garden, which is a new thing for us. We're very excited. We have the muscle of farmer Teddy to plant things and to mulch things. And upcoming classes include sheep to shawl, making natural dyes for inks and watercolors, um, thickening dyes and using them for silkscreen and surface design. Uh, beginning natural design, not natural dyeing, and knitting design, eco dyeing. We're trying to make a more colorful life. Uh, yeah, and that's what we do at the folk school. So that's enough for me. Let's find out what Catherine has to say. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Yeah. Uh, Martha, you know a lot about natural dyeing. <laughs> and, on wool, on wool, on wool. <laughs> on wool, on wool, but I, you know, but because it's, it's what you've done. So thank you. Thank you for that introduction. That was, that was really great. Um, I am going to start right away. I'm going to pull up my screen, but I, I, it's just really nice to be here. And thank you for having me. And um, I'm delighted to see all of these folks from all over the place who are here today. Many of them I know and lots of them I don't. So let's pull up my screen right here. And we will do this right here. Okay. Um, like all the rest of you, I have been home for the last number of months. And there's been something kind of sweet about that in a way, because it's given me a chance to pay attention to my garden, pay attention to my dying, and pay attention to everything in front of me. And I have tried to do that. So this right here is a picture that Farmer Teddy sent to me just the other day. This is the Corey Brown Memorial Dye Garden at the Folk School. And we're seeing indigo there, we're seeing marigolds in the background. There are other plants that are not well defined right now because we're not up close to them. I know there's some cotton growing. And both Teddy and Martha have been doing some wonderful um, Instagram videos about the garden and the plants there. And I'd, I'd recommend that any of you go and look at those. I just wanna say one word about the garden at the folk school. And um, the person that probably made this possible was Donna Brown. And Donna is um, from Denver. Donna has taught at the folk school many, many times. And um, she's a wonderful natural dyer. And she got this Janice Ford Memorial Dye Garden started at, um, in Denver at the Botanical Gardens. And it's used for education. And it's a really, really wonderful community project. So it's, um, it's, it's nice to see all of these things kind of come together. This is my garden. And my garden is a combination of dye plants and vegetables. Um, I don't grow a lot of anything. I began growing things um, about 10 or 12 years ago, mostly to understand the plants. That's all I thought I was going to do, is just understand the plants. But it's turned out to be an important part of my dye vocabulary. So let's talk about yellows, first of all. Um, weld is my favorite dye. I, I really have to say, it, and it's certainly my favorite yellow. It is um, originally from the Middle East and Europe, though it grows here very, very well. I plant a four by eight foot bed of it every single year, and I have plenty to do all of my dyeing and to share with classes. Um, this is what it looked like just a couple of weeks ago. It's taller than me. The dye comes from the, um, the leaves, the flowers, the seeds, and I dry it and then use it all year. And it is probably the most light fast of all of the yellow dyes. 
This is the clear, clear color I get from those dried plant materials that I will keep on my shelf and, and use as I need them. So um, the weld is not a plant that you're likely to find growing in the wild, not in this country anyway. Um, so if you want to use weld, it's something that you have to plant, but it grows very, very easily. These are some other yellows growing in my garden, Dyer's chamomile, um, but also the chamomile that is grown for tea that also makes a beautiful dye. And they're slightly different. The tea chamomile is a little bit brighter in yellow, but, but they're both relatively light fast and they both work. I have a lot more of the Dyer's chamomile in my garden because that's the one, that's the plant that keeps coming back. And um, I don't wanna to work too hard, you know, at growing something else. So the Dyer's chamomile has taken over. Um, the flowers are little tiny things and picking those flowers is a little tedious, but it's, it's, you know, the more you pick, the more develop. So, you know, we go out there in the morning, Kent and I, and pick flowers and then I dry them. Those are get dried as well. Marigolds, um, I brought some seeds back from France about 12 years ago and I planted those same seeds or I've collected seed every year. And uh, one year I, I separated my orange from my yellow uh, marigolds to see if there was any difference in the color. There certainly wasn't. Um, they're all the same. So everything kind of gets mixed up together. Um, I pick them, pop those things right off the plants. I dry them on screens and um, can use them all year. And I use them with my teaching a lot. Dyer's coreopsis is another plant that I have and Mexican marigold or Mexican tarragon. I first saw this in Mexico growing and found out I could grow it here. And it's also a culinary herb. It smells just like tarragon. It can, uh, you know, the leaves, the greenery, and it can be used as a culinary herb as well makes a very light, fast yellow. These are all yellow dyes. This is my broom, which had got, this is my dyer's broom, which had actually gotten out of control. I couldn't even get in my studio. So one day I had to go out and chop it all back, hung it to dry. And this is the beautiful yellow color. Uh, again, it's, it's got a lot of the same dyes in it that are found in the weld. This is not a plant that you're going to find in the wild, but this is why I grow it at home. It's a shrub, it's a perennial, and it just keeps getting bigger and spreading. It's beautiful. This is an unusual plant that I was introduced to a few years ago. It's, uh, it's called Chinese skullcap, and it's different from the Native American skullcap. Um, it's a medicinal plant in Japan and China, and there are lots of flavonoids in the root. It's the roots of this plant that are used, and they take several years in the ground to develop. Um, um, but it's, you know, so I don't use a lot of this, but again, I grow it because I want to understand some of these plants. And this was used historically as a dye plant in China. Okay, so Martha mentioned some of the, the, the books that have become available or, or that have been written over the years. Mary Frances Davidson, who wrote this little book um, back in 1950s. It was, it was recipes of things that could be collected in the neighborhood, as well as a few other things. Um, Emma Conley, who was up at Pen near Penland School of Crafts, and she wrote a book that there are a lot of similarities between the two of them because they both focus on plants that can be gathered locally. And then Jim Lyle's book from, the early, from 1990, where he put together um, a more scientific and global approach to natural dyeing, but his reference point was here because he was from here. Um, and then Wild Mountain uh, Time, the, these are native plants and this was written by Dee Dee Stiles just last year. And it's beautiful. This one actually has colored pictures of plants. And it's not about dyeing, but it's about plants that can be harvested locally. Now, Dee Dee once told me that she met Mary Frances Davidson a long time ago and she wanted to be Mary Frances Davidson when she grew up. So I think Dee Dee has done really, really well. And it's a beautiful little book that talks about the plants from here. 
So these are the kinds of plants that can be found in the region that will, that will give color. Broom sedge, goldenrod, mullein, Queen Anne's lace, all of these plants are, can be gathered in the wild and give color. They're all what are called flavonoids, um, which means that they're all going to give yellow colors. And they're all going to require a mineral mordant. Um, alum is the most common mineral mordant. Without that mineral mordant, without the alum, there will be no color from those plants. So the, the, the mordant attaches those colors to the fiber. It doesn't matter what the fiber is, wool, cotton, silk, it, they, they have to have that mordant to attach. So these are some um, experiments I did just, a few, just three or four weeks ago in my own yard. I gathered um, just some plants in the yard, wild grape leaves, dyer's chamomile, weld, those are from the garden, the broom was from the garden, but apple leaves, sumac leaves, they were from the wild. And I got these colors, these pale yellows and beiges on the left. When I added calcium carbonate to the dye bath, chalk, that's all it is, is chalk, um, I got brilliant, brilliant, brilliant yellows. And the reason for that is that many of these dyes um, are acidic, and here in the mountains where I live anyway, um, I live just outside of Asheville, I have well water and my well water is acidic. And the dye bonds to the fiber much, much more successfully when, um, when the dye bath is neutral or even slightly alkaline. And what chalk does is it neutralizes any acid that's in the bath. So that's a huge difference in color, brilliant colors versus very, very pale colors from locally gathered plants. Now, I've lived here in the mountains of North Carolina for, well, since the, about the time Martha arrived at the folk school, it was 1976 that I came here. And I'm, <laughs> My living here has been a very, very important part of, in the work that I've done, and it's made all kinds of things possible. But I also have to say that my education in natural dyes has been global. And I have had teachers and opportunities to travel to many, many places in the world and to study with people and to see how they do things. And that's a lot of what has given me a perspective. My very first dye experience ever was back in 1971 when I lived on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. And we went up into the mountains and we gathered plants and we, uh, you know, we even gathered natural alum at that time. And I had no idea what we were doing, but I was smitten at that, at that time. So this has been my education. People like this who have generously taught me over the years. But my own personal work, um, also incorporates weaving. I'm a weaver and I've been a weaver for many, many, many years. And in, um, through my weaving, I have developed a process whereby I weave a cloth and I put supplemental threads, weave supplemental threads right into that fabric and use them as a tool for gathering the cloth and dyeing so that whether, whether those extra threads are in the weft or in the warp, it, um, um, I gather, gather the fabric and then that defines resists. Uh, so that when dye is applied, um, the resists don't allow the dye to go in and then I have a dyed pattern in the cloth. So this piece, this is, um, I've, this, the last couple of years I've been working on a series from my garden. This is, um, this is a piece called Weld, one garden series, Weld. And um, just to give you an idea of the scale of this, this exhibition was at Penland School of Crafts last year. Title of the exhibition was Further Evidence, the Art of Natural Dye. So these are quite large pieces, all dyed with weld and treated with different mordants. 
This is a ser this is a very recent series that I've been working on currently. These are all narrow panels woven on my loom, and each one of these narrow panels is dyed with a different dye from my garden. So red. You know, when I first learned about natural dyeing many, many, many years ago, I went out and foraged and, you know, grabbed plants by the wayside and everything, of course, was yellow that I, that I brought home. Every plant gave me yellow and I kept thinking that if I looked hard enough, I would find something that would give me red. Well, I don't think that's really the case. I never did. Red comes from basically two different kinds of um, um, dye sources. One of them is um, an insect and the other is a root. Cochineal is their little, um, um, little insects, parasitic insects that grow on the prickly pear cactus. They originally come from Mexico, but they're, um, um, they're grown in Peru as well right now. And the other is lac, which grows in Indonesia. And that's another parasitic indigo that grows in this resin that you can see on this stick. That's why it's sometimes called stick lac. And the other red is a plant. So we've got two insects and we have a plant and that is matter root. And um, they give slightly different, the cochineal and the lac insects give more purpley reds. The matter will give it more orangey, or flag red, um, but it's not something that you're likely to find growing in the wild. Um, this is my bed of matter. This is um, Rubia tinctoria. This is European matter. It's grown a bit since I took this uh, picture a couple of weeks ago, and I have to claim this year, I don't think I have a single weed in my matter bed. That has never been the case, but I've never been home quite as much. Um, there's another type of matter that originally, it's, it's also known as Indian matter, Rubia cordifolia, and I have one plant, and it wintered over. I was kind of surprised, but it grows into a very, very tall vine. The colors are slightly different, but again, I grew this because I wanted to understand it. Matter roots, radar plants have to be in the ground, and the roots have to develop for about three to four years before the dye develops. Um, this is one type of matter that you might find growing in the wild. It's called ladies bed straw, gallium verum. It does have some of the same colorants in the roots, but you can see the size of the roots. They're tiny, they're almost thread-like, and it would take so much of this to get any quantity of dye. Again, this is in my garden now, but I grew it just to understand it so I knew what it was about. But this is my matter bed when I dug it up a couple of years ago. I've harvested several times. I just you know, uh, loosen it all up, pull out the largest of the roots, and then amend the soil and cover it all back again. And the little roots, they just continue to up to grow more. So I pull them out. This is in the wheelbarrow, and I washed those, those roots, cleaned them well, and then the roots have to be dried. Um, they get ground, and then this is my matter on both cotton and wool. You can see the colors are really brilliant and really, really beautiful. This is, a, this is rather a precious dye and wonderful to use. Um, this is uh, another from the garden series, matter. Um, this is one dye, this is only matter. But the purples in this come from the interaction of the matter with iron. So that you can get a full range of color with a single dye by using mordants very carefully. And this is another in the series. Each one of these panels was dyed in matter and each one of these panels used a different mordant. This is all um, linen and cotton. So there's a, you know, quite a range of hues that can be gotten from um, using matter, uh, using alum and using iron and then combinations of both of those mordants. 
So blue, that's the triad, isn't it? Uh, yellow, red, and blue. So this is a photo taken in the folk school garden just a few days ago. This is Farmer Teddy, and he is harvesting um, the polygonum tinctorium. Sometimes this is referred to as um, Japanese indigo. This is an indigo that grows in temperate climates. As you can see, it grows really, really well here. These were my indigo plants when I first put them in the ground um, a, few, a number of weeks ago. And then I also harvested some of mine just the other day. Um, this is woad from my garden. It's, it's in bloom there on the right, but it's the leaves on the left that are the key part of all of these versions of indigo. Woad is European. It grows in even cooler climates. It, it does very, very well here. Um, the, the, the French word for it is pastel because it doesn't have as much um, indigo in those leaves. And so it gives paler colors, but it's exactly the same dye as you find in the polygonum. And then this is um, indigo ferrosa fruticosa. This is tropical indigo. There are a number of different types of tropical indigo. This is the kind of indigo that they would have grown on um, in the southeast part of this country for trade back in the 17 and 1800s. Um, in very hot climates, this is a perennial plant and it just keeps growing and you know, you lop off the leaves and it keeps growing. I, you know, I can, I can grow a few plants and I do it again to understand this plant and the differences between this and the others. But this, the, the tropical indigo is the highest uh, in indigotin content. This is, is Baptisia or false indigo. And there's so many people who think, oh, well, this is gonna give me blue. This is gonna give me blue. And it won't give you any blue whatsoever. It is not an indigo plant. I guess it's called false indigo because the leaves are somewhat similar. And then there are those blue flowers, but this is false indigo. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful plant and I have it growing in my yard, but it's not for dying. So the leaves are key. This is the key to the whole thing. You, the only reason you want flowers is to get seed so you can plant another crop. So um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to go to an indigo farm in Okinawa and take part in the indigo harvest there. As you can see, there's a lot of indigo growing. And we cut that indigo and then uh, we bundled it and we tossed it into these big, 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 deep round vats that are dug, they're concrete and they're dug into the ground. Um, there's sort of a, a screen, a round screen, that blue thing around the edge. It's a screen um, to contain the leaves so they can be removed later. And then the, it was filled with water and then it was weighted down and it was allowed to ferment for a couple of days. It was pretty hot and it fermented. And in the fermenting process, the indigo is released from those leaves. And then the leaves were hauled up in these great big, huge gnats. You can just see the work that this was. And, um, and hauled away and put on the compost because it's, it's the indicatin now or the precursors for the indica that's in that deep vat. But it still needs to go through another process. And that's oxidation because it's just kind of floating in there. But we need to get it to a point where the pigment is going to separate from the water and sink. And that's done by introducing oxygen. And so we, we did that for probably about an hour and a half to two hours steadily. And until this um, a deep blue foam uh, formed on the surface right here. And that was the key that was when we knew that it was time to just let it all settle and the pigment would sink 
down to the bottom and we came back the next day and siphoned off all the water and then the indigo pigment paste was at the bottom and that's what gets preserved and that's what is used for dyeing. Oftentimes it's dried in order to make powder but in this case they just make a paste from it. Um, it's a lot of work to extract indigo. I, I've done it once or twice on a very, very small scale. I will never do it to, uh, I, to get all of my indigo. I purchased my indigo from Stony Creek Colors in Tennessee. Um, this is the only place in the United States where indigo is uh, being grown commercially, organically, in, in the most marvelous way but it's, it's, it's a small industry. And they are working with farmers there who used to grow um, tobacco. So it's, and the quality of indigo that they are growing is really, really high. So this is where I get all of my indigo pigment. But I do use my leaves. I use my woad leaves. I, um, I grind them up. I make balls out of them. I dry my persicaria leaves. Um, I make these little patties, little balls, I dry them, and these become ingredients that go into my indigo vat to promote fermentation. Because in order to get indigo um, to be in solution so that it will die, you have to, well, I am fermenting it. I'm fermenting it. It's kind of stinky, but you, you know, there's a lot of vegetable matter in it, but that's what makes it possible to die with it. So this is wonderful cycle here. And indigo is blue and it will give you all shades of blue. And this is an, uh, again, another part of the garden series in indigo. And this is another series I'm working on right now uh, with individual panels and exploring the whole concept of different values of, of indigo dye. Now green, Martha talked about green on um, um, Instagram, on a, a little video she put on in, um, um, Instagram the other day. There's green everywhere. There's just green everywhere. And none of this is for the taking as far as a dye. It's all chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is so fugitive, it'll go away in a day. It's just not, it, it just doesn't translate to textiles. There is one way to get all of types of greens and that's to take a brilliant yellow. This is some of my weld and add varying amounts of iron to it. Very, very, very small amounts of iron and that will give you olive greens. But the only way to get these beautiful grassy, grassy greens is to combine a yellow with indigo. So it's a two-step process to get this kind of green and always will be. But that's how these panels were done. These were all first dyed in indigo and then mordanted and then dyed with in yellows from the garden um, using different mordants as well to tone those colors. So this is the class that I was going to teach in the spring, the one that never happened. Um, the topic of this class was natural dyes on wool with no mordants. You know, and I told you that all of the plants that we would gather around to give us all of those yellows all require mordants, no matter what the fiber. But there's a whole class of dyes, including indigo, of course, that requires no mordant at all. So there are yellow dyes, um, and they're not going to, for the most part, they're not going to be the flowers and the leaves, with the one exception of safflower petals. But the rhubarb root, dock root, pomegranate rind, and lichen, though I will, Though I will say, um, I, with lichen, you have to be careful and only, only gather windfalls because it's precious and we shouldn't be taking it from trees or rocks or anything else. But if it's on the ground, it's going to die anyway. So that's a good thing. There are red and brown dyes that don't require a mordant if treated in a certain way. Um, black walnut hulls, madder root, cochineal, 
um, alkanet root, eucalyptus, that's growing in my garden right now too. Now, these dyes are treated slightly differently. They are combined with tannins. And in this class, I was going to work with a local tannin, which is sumac. I collected and dried lots and lots of sumac leaves last fall. It's a wonderful gallic tannin, but the combination of tannin and an acid like vinegar will make a bath in which these dyes will attach to those fibers. Now, you look at the, the textile in that dye pot right there, and I've got the lichen, it's just in a net bag and it's cooking right along with the textile itself and all those little white spots on the fabric. This is a fabric that I wove of wool and cotton, but these types of dyes, when treated this way, will only dye the wool and they won't dye the cotton at all. So the cotton essentially acts as its own resist. Um, this on the left is a, uh, a wool and cotton woven fabric with no dye. Then it was dyed in lichen or matter or cochineal. And then the patterns that were woven in the cloth get revealed. Um, when combined with indigo, the indigo will dye the cotton. It will also dye the other, the wool. And then you have a whole other vocabulary of color happening. And if you have a yarn that's a combination of wool and cotton, as this one is, you can use that, this type of dyeing as a design element. Um, the one on the left was dyed with indigo and, um, and uh, rhubarb root. And the one on the right was dyed with matter and indigo. Um, this gives you lots of opportunities for designing and using resists. And this is one of my pieces that I did. Um, I'm using, this is all wool and cotton, using resists like this with, let's see, it was rhubarb root on the left and cochineal in the center and matter on the right. And I dye a lot of wool. I dye lots and lots of what my, most of my, I would say most of my artwork is all cotton, but I needed to learn how to dye wool. I needed to learn more about dyeing of wool. So I took up rug hooking a few years ago and it's a wonderful opportunity to use all of my leftover dye baths and, um, and, and I just keep dyeing. And I have all of these wonderful colors to choose from. This is another rug that I've done. This one I finished in the first month of COVID when I was home. And then this is another one that's in the works right now. This is, a, this is quite a large one. This is about three by five feet and I, I'm about halfway finished with this one now. So um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my dear friend and colleague, Joy Botrup. Joy is the co-author for the book that we did together. Joy is from Denmark. She is a textile chemist and an engineer. And Joy was able to give me very logical explanations for all of the things that I didn't understand and all of the things that were so confusing to me because, you know, uh, books aren't always consistent about the information that they give. And so what we did together was the book that I wanted about 10 years ago to answer my own questions. And I'm going to just point out one other book that um, uh, is just, if you're interested in natural dyes and why people use them, this is a beautiful book done by Keith Recker. Um, he included me in this. And there are probably about over 20 artisans in this book, each one focuses on a different dye, a different, and, and why they use it and what they're doing with it. And there are beautiful colors and beautiful short stories. So I would recommend that you, you look at that. And I do have a blog on natural dyes. Um, you can get that through my website. And I try to post a lot of what I'm 
working on um, a lot of my experiments and a lot of my results. So, um, so that's it. So thank you. Let's see. Let me stop that. All right. Thank you, Catherine. You've got a ton of comments, lots of familiar names there in the chat, but people are sending heart emojis, clapping emojis, <laughs> and lots of comments on how beautiful your garden is and how beautiful your work is. So thank you. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> We've got a ton of questions, so I'm gonna gonna get to those quickly. Um, I just want to say to anyone, I have to give a plug to the Folk School. If you enjoyed this presentation and you would like to donate to the Folk School, we are going to share a link to a tip jar. Um, so if you want to donate, you can donate any amount there. And Nick, can you share that in the chat now, Nick or Tammy? Um, so we'll share that now and. Um, um, we're going to go ahead and get straight to the questions. There were a few very excited people that sent me questions ahead of time. So I, just to make sure that we get to those, I'm, I'm going to ask a few of them. So Cindy Solomon said, I have a ready supply of black walnuts that I pick up on my walks in the fall. What condition do they need to be in to use? Should they still be green? And can you speak to your process for using them? Yes, you want to use them when they're still green. And if you, if you let them rot and uh, turn brown on the ground, the jugulon, which is the dye stuff in it, will get damaged. So you want to start gathering them when they're ripe and they start to fall, but you want to pick up the green ones. Um, I will gather them up. I will put them in a net bag. I will put them in the dye pot along with my textile. No mordant is required on wool. You do need a mordant on cellulose. Um, and it'll give, and it is a long, slow dye bath that will benefit from even sitting overnight if you want really dark color. And every fall I gather them and I freeze my walnuts so I can pull them out and use them at any time. So. And Catherine, where, where can people buy your book? Oh, any place you, you buy books. Any bookstore will um, order it. You, they can get it directly from Schiffer. Um, I, any, any place that you buy books. Mm -hmm. Your local bookstore, they will order it for you. They may not have it on the shelf, but they'll order it. And I did see it's on Amazon too, and I, I shared mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. it is. Okay, great. All right, one more question that was emailed to us about some local plants. You know, you, you did already talk about that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and Susan, I just wanted to let you know, we did get your question, but we had, we addressed that. So local plants that you can use. And we don't know where you are, but hopefully th that addressed your question. All right, so Nick, you have a, um, quite a few questions in the Q&A. Do you want to share those with us? I do. Um, Allison Adams asks, what are the ideal condi conditions for growing weld? And what are your recommended seed sources? Um, weld is really hardy and it, it grows very, very easily. It is a biennial. So you plant it toward the end of the summer and get the little plants established before winter. And then it, um, the next season, the plants will grow tall. And I wait until the seed heads have developed before I harvest them. Um, I'm going to have a lot of seed this year and I'm always happy to share it if anybody wants to, I, I mean, up to a certain point, if anybody wants to get in touch, I'd be happy to send seed out when I, when I have it available. Um, I, I have bought mine, I think, from medicinal seeds before. I, I, you know, it's Janista. No, it's um. Oh, I, you know, the Latin name just went out of my head. But um, you can you can get it pretty regularly, pretty easily. Okay. But get it in by the end of the summer. Okay. Connie Lippert asks, my yellows from marigolds tarnish over time. Is there a way to avoid that? Tarnish. I would assume tarnish means they get dull. Um, yellows, yellow dyes are the most sensitive to light, period. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, you have to think really carefully about exposure and where you keep these things. Um, you know, there are certain yellow dyes that I would never use. 
um, in a textile that hangs out in the light all the time. Weld is the most light fast. Um, I, it's, it's going to happen. You look in textiles in museums and the yellows, you know, have disappeared and will disappear before the matter reds or before the indigo blues. It's just a fact of life. And one thing I did not address in the last question is that um, weld will grow almost anywhere and it doesn't particularly need incredible soil. I always get an amazing crop of weld in my gravel driveway where I strip my leaves off the stems. So, you know, it takes root there and so it doesn't need special soil. Okay. Uh, Trish Hanna asks, how long can you keep dried mortar roots and still get color? Matter roots, pardon. Um, oh, as long as it's, they're com as long as they're dry, you can keep them a long time. I, you know, I would say indefinitely, as long as you keep them really dry and they don't get moldy or anything. Yeah, we can keep them a long time. Um, Aaron O'Hannon asks, um, is that about your shirt? Uh, can you tell us about uh, the origin of your glass? <laughs> oh, oh gosh. I, yeah. um, this is, um, this is a, an actually a beautiful print of a um, an indigo shibori, and it is done by a friend of mine in Texas, uh, Debbie Maddie at Calico Carriage, and she does a line of quilting fabrics. Um, she does the originals, and then they are printed by Moda in Japan. Um, thank you, uh, Janet Matthews asks. Uh, you, you mentioned braiding sweetgrass in your blog and something about wild strawberries as a source of alum. Can you say something about that? Wild strawberries as a source of alum. I don't recall that. Okay. I don't, I mean, there are, other, there are plants that are source of alum, but not wild strawberries. Um, Simplocus, which grows, or horse sugar, which grows down um, in the lowlands of South Carolina is, can be used as a source of alum. It's not commercially viable, but it is an alum accumulator. And in certain soil conditions, it does absorb alum. Okay. Um, if you could only grow one plant for yellow, what would that be? Weld. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to your indigo after it has been harvested? Does it, oh, is it dried or used fresh? Uh, we missed that. Okay, um, I, I harvest a couple of times. I, I harvest the polygonum. I, you know, it's a knotweed, so I cut it and then it, it keeps growing and I'll get to harvest it again before the end of the summer. I dry those leaves. And I use them in these fermentation vats that I'm working with. Some people harvest their fresh leaves and do um, something called a fresh leaf dyeing, where you get, you can, you're essentially taking this indigo reduction that's inside the leaf and quickly transferring it to a silk textile. And there's a lot, there's a lot of information on the web about that. There are a lot of people doing that. It's beautiful. It, the, the, it's, it's not the same as an indigo vat. The color is different. It's more turquoise. It isn't as light fast as an indigo vat, but it's great fun and wonderful to experience. On the subject of indigo, uh, Brittany Bowles asks, was there any lime or flocculent used to settle the indigo extraction in Okinawa? Yes, and a very, very carefully controlled amount, because if too much was used um, which, the, which happened one year with these particular folks in Okinawa. They used too much lime and, and it all bound to the indigo and there was no pigment left. So they, they, they measure that very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have you ever dyed with uh, chamisa to get yellows or greens mixed with indigo? I've seen some lovely chamisa yellows from New Mexico. I don't know that plant. I, 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 I don't know that plant, Chamisa, but any yellow combined with indigo is going to give you beautiful greens. It, yeah, I mean, yellows are the things, 
yellows are the colors that are going to be most local and you're going to have the most opportunities to gather local yellows. Um, the blues and the reds are much more limited. As I said, you know, you've got cochineal, you've got lac, and you have matter, and that's about it. The reds and blue is indigo, but there are many varieties of that. But I don't know that plant. Uh, Kristen K Crane asks, do you have any experience dying with anything from the ocean, such as algae or seaweeds? I don't. I don't. I don't live on the ocean, and no, no, I don't. <laughs> So, uh, Nick, I know you have a lot of questions there. I think the way we might handle this is, is we can send these questions to you, Catherine. Afterwards, we can send the chat and the Q&A. Um, and also, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, should they go to your website and contact uh, yeah, you? Yeah, and they, you, you, can, you can do it through there, yes. And you can also access the blog through the website. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So there are a lot of questions in the chat, so I wanted to hand that over to Tammy and see if she can um, get some of those, those questions answered before we are done. Thank you, Nick. Sure thing. Okay, so a few of my questions. Um, we had one lady that says, um, was there any lime added to the water extraction in Japan? I think I just answered that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Catherine, okay. So uh, let's see, we have another one here. How do you keep indigo from coming off uh, if dying fleas? The indigo comes off when spinning. Ah, uh, crocking, crocking, it, rub, it, it rubs off. Indigo is notorious for crocking. It's a pigment and it, um, yeah. it's kind of the nature of the beast, but, very, very careful dyeing, and also very, very careful and thorough washing and finishing can eliminate a lot of that. And uh, this crocking issue is one of the reasons that I began um, working with fermentation indigo vats to eliminate lime in my vats, um, so that I, because I think the lime may be part of the problem. I don't, I'm not 100% sure about that, but it's the nature of indigo. So, but very thorough washing, hot washing. And okay. Martha could probably address that better. Okay, one lady said, can you use carrot, which is the same family as Queen Anne? No. Carrots, the color in carrots, the vegetable is a carotenoid. And carotenoids, those, you know, um, carotenoids are going to be in yellow and red vegetables. Um, it is, it's a great dye for food, but it does not work for textiles because the, the, the colorants in that are not water soluble. They're soluble in oil or fat, like tomatoes. That's a carotenoid. So no, it, you know, basically I think you can almost say that anything that is edible is not a good textile dye. Okay, last one real quick. Someone okay. wants to know what type of loom do you use? I have a, um, I have an AVL CompuDobby loom. Mm -hmm. It's about 40 inches wide and with 16 shafts and a computer attached to it. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. All right. Catherine, there have been a number of questions about how you make your, the, the balls that you make out of the woad and the indigo leaves. And yeah. some people have asked what your process is and if you add ash to those or if you add anything else. No, I don't. I, I, I don't. All I do is, well, once I took a grinding stone and I ground it all up and I made balls. And, um, and then I got an old food processor at the Habitat Restore and that's what I use and grind it up and make little balls. And I... I put them out to dry in this climate and they all molded. So now I use an old food dehydrator to, uh, to dry them and they dry in a matter of hours and then I can store them that way. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Okay, well, we're, we're almost at five o'clock, so I want to go ahead and respect your time, but we will um, we'll share some of these resources and these links in a follow-up email, and we will send you some of those questions, Catherine, to, um, okay. if you wanted to answer any of them. Um, also, the books that you shared, the um, historic books on natural dyeing, one of our um, um, sales associates from the craft shop mentioned that we do carry those books in the craft shop right. and you can call in order to have them delivered and they may be able to even get your book. Um, I'm not sure if we have it, but I would think that we do. Well, I know they have had it. I know they have had it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have it in stock, you can call the craft shop and um, we can send you that book. So I highly encourage you to visit Catherine's website and her blog. You can nerd out for hours on the science of dying and it's just, you have beautiful photographs and it's really worth a look. Um, and we, um, we do have a lot of natural dying classes at the folk school, as Martha mentioned. We have a dozen that will be included in this catalog that's coming out on Friday. So I encourage you to take a look at our e-catalog um, and look for our dying classes in 2021. Um, and again, we, if you enjoyed this webinar, we did share the link to the tip jar. Feel free to send us a donation. And Catherine, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. This was fun. This, yeah, this was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a real treat. Yeah. Do you have any more webinars on the horizon people can look for? Um, I'm doing a couple of programs toward the fall um, for, for uh, fiber guilds fiber gills in both Texas and uh, California. This, this is the just kind of amazing thing about all of this is now we can virtually go anywhere. And I'm also going to be participating in an Indigo conference in um, Hokkaido, Japan in September. I was supposed to be there, but now I'm having to make a video. So um, I, I'll send you a link to that. They haven't posted that information yet, but it will, it'll be posted next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you send it, we can share it in our follow-up okay. email tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if they sign up for your newsletter and in, in your blog. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. And the, the next webinar um, and the Appalachian Traditions webinar will be held on August 17th. And it will feature Jason Lawnen, who's a woodworker, an iron worker, and a folk school instructor. And his specialty is forging tools and projects that mix wood and iron work. So he'll be teaching a class in 2021. Um, so if you'd like to register for that, we will share that link there. Um, I think we lost Catherine. So thank you, Catherine. Oh, oh I'm, no, that's okay. I'm just, here. I'm here. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> okay. Oh, and we, thank you. you, know, you. I'm going to leave the um, this program open just for a couple of minutes so people can um, copy any chats. Um, links that they want to, to take away, but I'll go ahead and let you go now, Catherine. Um, okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you to everyone for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021.